So good morning and, and welcome to this uh, morning plenary session. I'm, I'm especially happy about this, this session uh, and, and proud to present two important researchers of, uh, of the Internet, uh, a place where much is going on and which uh, is probably also one of the research interests of many of you here. Uh, the first one might be a person who you might not have been familiar with uh, at the end of uh, the beginning of this week, but hopefully have made friends with um, uh, a, a good friend of mine, although we haven't met so much, but I feel like we have known forever, <laughs> and a folklorist like me, uh, Trevor Blank who is currently working as an associate professor of communication at the State University of New York at Potsdam. Uh, he's a folklorist specializing on digital folklore and also humor, uh, legends and belief in, folk, in, in the internet as well. Uh, he's the author or editor of numerous books. He's publishing uh, like several books a year, it seems. Um, some of them include Folklore and the Internet, Folk Culture and the Digital Age, The Last Laugh. That was a very good book, I think. Uh, some of which you can and, and should buy at the, the book desk. There is, it's still there today, so keep your eyes, eye, eyes open for these titles. Uh, he's currently uh, also editing a volume on uh, um, electronic folklore together with Ron Howard. Yes. Um, and as I've heard, he's also a talented musician and has built recently a guitar <laughs> and owns a collection of them. So welcome, Trevor Blank. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, I'm a folklorist, Trevor Blank, uh, and I, uh, I have come to uh, appreciate humor studies from the lens of folkloristics, uh, the academic study of folklore. Um, and so uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, my particular area of interest, which is uh, death, disaster, and scandal humor, uh, and how it proliferates online. Uh, I've been pre predominantly interested in um, trying to understand how people respond to bad things happening in the news with humorous expression online. And uh, that's led me down an interesting path into American celebrity culture, which I think has been kind of an interesting group um, to, um, to follow. So I wanted to start with a story, since I am a folklorist and I don't want to disappoint, um, about what kind of got me interested in studying digital humor in particular. I, I'd been interested in studying digital culture for quite some time, uh, but really there was this event in uh, June of 2009 that really crystallized it for me. I was teaching a class um, at a community college in Bloomington, Indiana, which is home to Indiana University, and I was uh, teaching a class, an introductory class on uh, folklore, and uh, somebody's cell phone vibrated in the middle of class, and I, have this, I had at this time a very strict no, no cell phone policy, and so I was kind of annoyed at first and kind of shot a look over like, what are you doing? And, uh, and he put his phone away, uh, but then his phone vibrated again about 30 seconds later, and he took it out, and he's, he kind of stammered to himself and said, I, I don't mean to interrupt class, but Michael Jackson has died. And the whole class gasped and uh, was really shocked. But then something really interesting happened and really helped me to, to see the importance and power that, uh, that computer-mediated communication technologies have. Um, about 30 seconds after this student had told the class that Michael Jackson had died, I heard this zzz sound from across the room. And then shortly thereafter, another zzz, and then zzz, zzz. And across the classroom, within a 10 to 15 minute period, I had 15 students in the class, 13 of them had received some kind of a text message telling them that Michael Jackson had died. And so we were watching this kind of moment unfold right before our eyes. 
Uh, and I found it to be really fascinating that, uh, that it was spreading so quickly. And um, so I, I uh, did what any uh, folklorist would do, which was suspend class immediately and start talking immediately about Michael Jackson's death. Uh, we tried to go to the Wikipedia page to update it and tell everybody that he had died, but somebody had already gotten there before us. Um, and we also found out that the internet was going very, very slow. Uh, and uh, we later found out the reason for that is because so many people had heard about the death of Michael Jackson at that time that they were all logging on at the same time, which slowed the infrastructure of the internet to a crawl, uh, making it very, very difficult to access any information, not just on Wikipedia, but everywhere. Um, so it, his death kind of broke the internet for a short period of time. But it wasn't very long after, uh, maybe 10 to 15 minutes before students in my class already started joking about Michael Jackson's death, uh, wondering if out loud if, if people would be moonwalking past his grave uh, or how were they going to recycle his plastic body. Uh, and I, I found this to be really interesting because it was so irreverent. Uh, but at the same time, a light bulb kind of went off in my head. I'd been for some time advocating for the study of the internet, which folklorists were a bit slow to uh, accepting. Uh, and I thought, this is a great entry point into, into studying how people express themselves in everyday life. And as a folklorist, that's what I'm really interested in, is how, how people express themselves and cultivate meaning in their lives in everyday settings. Um, and uh, I study informal traditional culture. Um, so a lot of what I will be talking about today is going to be talking about how the internet has, has kind of harnessed traditionality uh, and how these traditional forms have kind of morphed over time. And I'm using the example of celebrity culture as kind of a, an entry point into that um, because it's, uh, it's so pervasive in American culture that, that we are familiarized with the lives of celebrities. So. I, uh, I thought I'd begin by talking a little bit about the cognitive ways that Americans typically process interactions with celebrities. Due to the onslaught of gossip columns, magazines, tabloids, television programs, both satirical and genuine, internet-based news dissemination, and now even more ubiquitously through amateur and professional blogging and other forms of social media, every detail of, a celebrity, of celebrity culture is filtered, scrutinized, and presented through a vast web of opinion and manipulation and perpetual exchange. Celebrities in American culture are treated as if they are our neighbors, ordinary folks whom we know personally or intimately, as well as professionally. They are, in many ways, our intimate strangers. Uh, Americans are bombarded with tons of information about celebrities' personal lives, their beliefs, their temperaments, their physical appearances. And as ravenous consumers of popular culture, Americans have come to paradoxically know celebrities without actually knowing them, to a point where it's relatively easy to project our feelings onto them. Our relationships with these individuals comprise what anthropologist John Coey has called imaginary social worlds, or the interpersonal links that we make with public figures, the famous, and others whom we do not know in our personal lives, but nevertheless interact with frequently due to a rapport developed through mass-mediated outlets, such as our perception of a personal relationship with a trusty weatherman, despite never even meeting them in person. Um, and I, I think this is important to note because, especially with social media and things like Twitter, it seems we have this kind of illusion of, of easy accessibility to celebrities, um, and sometimes they actually tweet back, which, which makes it seem all the more real in a lot of ways. But because of this linkage, we're able to establish a much deeper emotional investment in the ways that a revered celebrity acts. Uh, the same goes for relationships with celebrities. Uh, however, when imagine, imaginary social world is ruptured, by a perception of betrayal to our relationship with a given celebrity, we symbolic redefine, symbolically redefine our relationship with them, often through the proliferation of humor. So in doing so, we are more able to distance ourselves from the severity of our relationship and thus rhetorically criticize and produce antagonistic folklore, which reaffirms our values while disputing those of a scandal-plagued celebrity. And you're gonna like this slide change here. Watch this, I spent a lot of time getting this slide down right there, changing the celebrities into what they ultimately became known, notorious for, uh, which in this case were arrests stemming from various different infractions. So in American culture, celebrities are kind of like a living museum exhibit. We can look, but we can't touch. Even though we cognitively realize that they're real three-dimensional human beings just like us, they're nevertheless put on a pedestal. It's natural for us to try to compartmentalize 
uh, the various aspects of a celebrity's death or scandal in an analytical way as we try to cope with the shock of their loss, especially when it's unexpected and even more so when it occurs under tragic circumstances, such as with a suicide or accidental drug overdose. In doing so, we sometimes have to work to reconcile our subconscious guilt that we didn't recognize a person in crisis or acknowledge that we were powerless to provide some sort of comfort to that person, if even only if symbolically through our fandom. But when a celebrity commits suicide, we experience the loss in a way that's typically divorced from the level of substantial grief that we experience when someone genuinely close to us passes away, but it's nevertheless very real because our relationships with celebrities are one-sided and personalized, like memories of their involvement with a record, a film, or a television program that made us feel good or inspired or challenged our thinking in a productive way. <clears throat> We project our feelings onto celebrities, which symbolically embody what many as Americans aspire to be, financially success successful and secure, loved and wanted, seemingly in control of their lives in a complex world. The majority of people in America won't attain mass wealth and fame in their lifetimes. So to most people, the life of a celebrity is akin to winning the lottery, as if they should be grateful for their opportunities and success and never fall into despair. They appear to have it all. But success can also be very isolating and lonesome at times, and most celebrities aren't on top forever, so adjusting to different levels of notoriety or even lack of recognition can be challenging as well. And even those uh, seemingly at the height of their careers are under tremendous, pre tremendous pressure to stay there, uh, to remain bankable, which can cause anxiety. And life in the public eye, where privacy is no longer guaranteed, comes with its own pitfalls and frustrations. So celebrity deaths and scandals force us to see them as real people because that is exactly what they are. So the interactions that take place in online venues where meaningful expression and dialogue occurs, such as blogs, forums, website comment sections, online gaming, etc., allow for a communicative exchange which, which feature a reciprocal communicator-receiver dynamic. Uh, we make personal or parasocial connections to celebrities and public figures, uh, but they're peripheral and internally regulated. By contrast, simulative social connections online allow for emotional validation regarding the investment of a fellow user's time, energy, and or trust by using the computer as a mediatory agent. Even though this, there is not a physical element to the communal discourse or individual conversations, the emotional connections remains palatable. Uh, so why is humor particularly in that which circulates online so central to vernacular discourse pertaining to celebrities? Well, I think there's several different components to it. And one of the, the areas that I think is particularly interesting as a folklorist is this notion of play, uh, that, we, that we need to, to play to work out our feelings. Uh, and a lot of folklorists have encountered what we, we've come to know uh, as a concept we call the triviality barrier, the idea that, uh, that something is trivial and therefore not a, a, a legitimate source of study. Uh, but it's exactly the stuff that we find most trivial that I find to be most interesting uh, and, and offers the most opportunities for us to kind of have a, a deeper understanding uh, of folk culture. So uh, part of this also relates to the fact that few things are more open, are difficult to discuss uh, openly than sexual, emotional, or domestic abuse or the graphic details that constitute such acts of violence, degradation, and perversion. It's for these precise reasons, however, that humor is allowed to flourish in the wake of such horrific occurrences when they're brought to the attention of mass culture, predominantly through mass media, which I'll come back to momentarily. According to Gershon Legman, the purpose of sharing obscene and grotesque humor is to absorb and control, even to slough off, by means of jocular presentation and laughter, the great anxiety that both teller and listener feel in connection with certain culturally determined themes. And as Alan Dundies, another folklorist, observes, folklore provides a socially sanctioned outlet for the discussion of the forbidden and taboo. Rather than confront the emotional weight of the despised acts or expose oneself to the necessary vulnerability required to process them, humor affords individuals a platform for testing the social boundaries of decorum and the ability to circumvent or challenge hegemonic forces, uh, particularly those through the media, that social boundaries of decorum and the, oh, I'm rereading the same sentence, uh, to install a dominant narrative, to challenge hegemonic forces that repeatedly seek to install a dominant narrative when widely publicized tales of horror, despair, and scandal come to the fore. Elliot Orient makes this abundantly clear in noting that humor is, quote, singularly suited to circumvent modernist inhibitions of sentiment. As a form of intellectual play, humor demands an ability to deal with the things and events of this world, even in the, emotionally, even the mo most emotionally charged things and events, as ideas to be manipulated within the structure of a joke. Consequently, a level of detachment is a prerequisite for the production and appreciation of humor, end quote. Uh, 
Thus, collecting and analyzing such humor is critically important to understanding the folk response to a major disaster or scandal. Celebrities operating in a highly visible and somewhat exalted status are a familiar yet malleable canvas for, for testing and projecting one's feelings. And jokes about celebrities, especially those that have become oversaturated in media coverage, serve as a pushback against their hold on popular culture. The internet is a less escapable form of medium. It's in our pocket, always on. So it's supposed to be open and egalitarian, but with so many voices it can become cacophonous or noisy and difficult to parse through. Uh, in the creation of parodic humor, uh, often in the form of memes, individuals also rely on metafolklore to appropriately craft a joke's form and content to meet the folk expectations. As a result, many of these jokes are self-referential and often take shape in response to other jokes. Collectively, then, their cultural inventory is strategically invoked to enlighten and at times even rationalize the present through the directed reappropriation of nostalgia, per personal experience, and metafolklore for new expressive and processual purposes. And I have an example here of uh, a meme that was popularly circulating online, the Hey Girl meme, uh, which features uh, Canadian actor Ryan Gosling. So while a lot of my research predominantly focuses on celebrities that are involved with the scandal, this is a good example of play at work and reappropriation. One of the hallmarks of studying folklore is, is looking for examples of what we call repetition and variation. The idea that something can repeat over time but also evolve as it, as it meets new contexts. Uh, and so I think this is a kind of a central component within the study of folklore that I'd like to apply to the study of memes because it, it really shows us how things evolve over time. And I'm going to provide a brief kind of history of how we got to image macros today, which are a, a, a major component of memes discussion. This is a good example of just kind of a playful meme that is utilized as a celebrity for recognizability, uh, but is not actually criticizing the celebrity so much themselves. Um, so this, uh, this particular meme started off uh, as a, a blog post, uh, a blog that was dedicated to Ryan Gosling called Fuck Yeah, Ryan Gosling. Uh, and it was all just pictures of him doing things where he was looking like his normal sexy self. Uh, walking around, doing his laundry, uh, and then uh, the creator of the blog started captioning, hey girl, and then having him do say something kind of sweetly, poetically, romantic seeming. Um, but eventually people caught on to this and started making memes of their own, uh, and it morphed over time uh, to be a lot of different things. Uh, but as an example of repetition and variation, this meme evolved in America in a kind of interesting way um, to being about Ryan Gosling to being about Paul Ryan, who is the Speaker of the House in the United States. Um, so it was Paul Ryan Gosling for a time. Uh, this is a transitional meme in that, in that kind of uh, uh, overture that uh, started to incorporate uh, what Paul Ryan is most known for in American culture. Um, other than being a disappointment, um, that uh, is um, his his ravenous and and uh, steadfast interest in the budget uh, and conservative economic policies. Um, so this was kind of a transitional meme that that brings in sort of this economic uh, motif, uh, but then eventually gave way to Paul Ryan uh, talking about different economic sort of things um, using the Hey Girl meme structure, and it evolved over time. But this is, again, a really great example of repetition and variation at work. We see the earliest examples uh, that uh, featured Ryan Gosling with the Hey Girl kind of motif in it, uh, but evolved to have a different kind of social commentary attached to it, one that was more politically uh, pungent, uh, one that was more directed and more had, had more of a direct target uh, as part of the humor. Um, but before I dis uh, get any further in discussing memes, I'd like to take a minute to kind of contextualize where they come from as a technologically mediated uh, tradition. And as, as I mentioned, as a folklorist, I'm interested in how tradition kind of uh, is utilized in expressive culture. Um, so what I see, uh, when, and when I'm referring to memes, uh, I'm predominantly talking about image macros, the, uh, which you've all probably encountered at some point, which is typically uh, an image that has text on the top, text on the bottom, and usually some kind of humorous component to it. Um, but image macros have, uh, have a longstanding tradition in 
uh, technologically mediated folklore that existed before the internet was even around. And I see one of the big correlations of that is Xerox lore, or photocopy lore, or photocopied humor. Uh, these are just some classic examples. Patrice, this is the only cat I could squeeze in, but that's the best I could do for that. But, uh, but photocopied humor, or Xerox lore, um, was utilized uh, in a similar way that memes are today. Uh, they were typically anonymously created. We didn't know who the original author was. They were circulated anonymously, and they were posted on bulletin boards and in people's offices uh, to, to get a chuckle, or sometimes to have a kind of uh, counter, um, uh, counter hegemonic uh, interpretation. Uh, this example on the left here, I have PMS and a handgun. Any questions uh, was reportedly uh, an example that was uh, popularly utilized by secretaries who, uh, in the time of the 1980s and 70s and 80s when this was circulating in America, uh, was predominantly a field occupied by females living in a uh, career field that was often overrun by white male administrators. And so this is kind of one way that this sort of helped to kind of uh, navigate through all of that. Um, but uh, it's important to note that uh, how we got to where we are today was a transitional period, and Xerox lore gave way to the earliest forms of internet expression, um, and maybe some of you remember even the news groups that it used to exist about humor that you could check out and share and post and send. Um, and uh, it's important to note that the reason why uh, this is what has been termed the Web 1.0 era, the era of the internet where it became publicly available for people to uh, utilize. Now, the internet has been around much longer than 1992 when it became more of a public domain, um, it, but it was, uh, it was in the early 90s that this became much more ubiquitous and available for all people to interact with. But internet connections were rather slow. I certainly remember that. Uh, and my, I always blow my students away when I tell them that websites used to take 30 seconds to a minute to load. They always kind of look at me like, how the hell did you get anything done? Um, because it just seems like such a long period of time, even though now three seconds may seem like too long of a period of time for, for something to load. But because the, the medium was slow and we ran on phone lines, predominantly in the United States, uh, and internet connections weren't particularly fast, uh, it made it difficult to, sh to share images and movies and files and stream things because those, it just wasn't possible. So naturally, there was more of an inclination towards text-based humor uh, and emailed humor and uh, f chain letters that were forwarded around to different people. Um, and you may recall uh, receiving at some point in your, uh, in your life, uh, probably, receiving emailed uh, letters that in implore you to send it to other people and, and to share it. And, and if you do so, you'll be rewarded by the person whom you have a crush on falling in love with you or some other kind of uh, promise that is made there. Uh, but I've also included some of these original uh, emoticons and structures um, that, that were utilized online to kind of linguistically cue uh, different forms of expression online, which I think is interesting um, because one of the things that uh, I, I found a lot when I was first starting to study the internet uh, was that a lot of folklorists were, uh, were not sure um, that the internet was a viable area of study because uh, we weren't having face-to-face -face communications. And because we didn't have face-to-face -face communications, we were losing a lot of the expressive dynamics that take place when we see someone in a social situation. But what I found, and what other folklorists and other scholars and many of you have found, uh, is that it's quite a dynamic area for expressing oneself. And people have adapted in various ways to try to utilize the medium's strengths uh, to kind of to bridge that gap, and it's become more prominent over time. So there's a couple of examples that really kind of, I think, uh, helpfully propelled uh, the study of internet folklore. Of course, these were watershed moments in American history. Um, and I apologize for my kind of Americanist, uh, ethnocentric viewpoint. Uh, my training is in American folklore studies, and so I've, I've endeavored to predominantly study American culture. Um, so my examples are predominantly from there. Um, but 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina, um, you may not be, if you're not familiar with Hurricane Katrina, was this very devastating uh, hurricane that, that uh, affected uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, which is one of the great uh, southern cultural hubs of the United States. Um, this is, these moments in time were what Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet have called, has called flashbulb memories. Uh, flashbulb is in when a, a photograph goes off. They're, they're imprinted in our minds and we're reminded of them um, 
for long periods of time, and they stick with us. Uh, but during this time, or in the early 2000s, uh, the internet began to, to take over from previous different technologies as a primary, primary means of communication. And with that, we saw new traditions developing, such as Photoshopped art. Uh, and these are just two examples from 9-11 and uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, that were popularly circulating online. And I'm indebted to a number of scholars who have done great work uh, on this um, for, for certain. Um, because I was, uh, I was still uh, a senior in high school when 9-11 took place. So I'm, uh, I, I had to come to it after the fact. So I, I'm indebted uh, to your work, for example, uh, certainly. Um, but I, I want to give an example that I think was predominantly um, uh, shared and kind of marks one of the transitions into what has been called the Web 2.0 era. Uh, around 2000, uh, we started seeing uh, the ability to compress visual files in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a helpful way, in an easy to access way. Um, because of being the ability to compress files, we were able to share images more. Uh, streaming video wasn't far behind. Uh, and because of this, and, be, uh, and because of all the simultaneous occurrence of greater accessibility to the internet and faster internet connections, uh, we saw this robust medium of visual humor start to take shape. And I think this is one of the defining characteristics uh, of, the, of the Web 2.0 era and folklore in the digital age is when we started transitioning into, uh, into visual humor as a primary means of expression. Um, so this example, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, was circulated online uh, around uh, late September, early October of 2001. So when September 11th was still very fresh in people's minds. Uh, and I, I remember actually receiving an email that had this picture in it when I was in high school uh, that had a narrative that, that went something along the lines that a, uh, a disposable camera was found at the grounds of the World Trade Center attacks and somebody developed that film and this was the, one of the pictures that was in there. Uh, and immediate, and at first look, when people were looking at this, um, they thought perhaps this was one of the greatest, uh, most amazing pictures that had ever been captured uh, because it seemed to show moments right before um, the attacks of 9-11 taking place. Uh, but what people soon started to kind of piece together and figure out was um, some things didn't quite add up. Why, for example, um, did the photographer not notice a giant plane coming towards them? Uh, why is the plane not blurry? Um, why doesn't the guy who's standing there staring at the camera hear a jet plane coming behind them? Uh, and then, of course, the, people got even more nitty-gritty into that um, to uh, ex note that it wasn't particularly cold that day, so he's a little overdressed. Uh, and so it, it eventually was discovered that this was a, a hoax, uh, a, and a, a good one at, at that. Um, but it, this, this uh, started a trend of, uh, of Photoshopping. It didn't start a trend, but it was a part of, uh, of popularizing a trend of using Adobe Photoshop uh, to create your own images and to, uh, and to, um, to mess with people using digital technologies. Uh, now, initially, this required some kind of expertise or familiarity with this technology to be able to do it, so it wasn't available to really for everybody in a, in a folk sense. Um, but that's kind of changed over time as people have become more adapted to it, and now um, programs like Photoshop and similar programs have made it much easier. But people were pissed when, this, uh, when it was discovered that this was a hoax. It was, it, this is actually a, a photograph of somebody on top of the World Trade Center, but I believe the photo was taken in 1997. Um, and so in response to this, this started a meme that he became known as the tourist guy or the tourist of death and, and other variations of that. Um, so people started kind of creating their own versions of, uh, of him, uh, appearing at different points in history um, where other disasters have taken place. And you'll notice that, of course, uh, here they've uh, also changed the date there. Uh, and then, uh, uh, of course, um, where was King Kong when we needed him? became a joke in and of itself. Um, and uh, so I think this, this again shows uh, how this medium started to kind of take off on its own uh, because it was funny. And uh, the thing that also was interesting to me as a folklorist was how um, people tried to cue their, their experiences 
um, based on references to different elements of popular culture. If you're not familiar with King Kong or, or, or the film or the story, uh, this last example just looks like a silly gorilla behind him. Instead, it has much deeper meaning if you're involved with or know the, the, the context that is part of it. Um, so again, this brings me back to this notion of repetition and variation, which I want to hammer in as a folklorist because it's a, it's a key aspect of this. So just to show you one more example of the evolution of Xerox humor all the way up into the present, um, different examples of Xerox humor and then, um, then eventually manifesting in uh, a meme of this kind. And, uh, and memes themselves have developed into kind of traditional patterns uh, that we can observe uh, I love this example on the right. I, I often use it in my classes. I don't know how many of you have seen these Dos Equis Man commercials, but uh, they're, they're no longer running, but in the United States, they were a popular beer commercial, uh, which featured this, uh, this silver-haired man uh, who would perform these different kind of feats um, and of grandiosity, and at the end of it, he would say, I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer Dos Equis. And uh, it was such a popular uh, commercial uh, that it gave way to a whole meme involving him uh, that basically followed the formula, I don't always do X, but when I do, Y. Um, but it required, again, familiarity with the commercial in order for it to be successful. Uh, and this was something that was shared a, a great deal. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different examples of people using this, uh, this particular meme for expressive purposes. Um, and other folk art that I collected uh, at the time, uh, some of you may remember the BP oil spill uh, that took place. Uh, it was uh, big news in America, certainly. Um, this example on the left here was, uh, was made by an artist and uh, uh, showing the superhero Aquaman uh, succumbing to the oil, and uh, on the right, utilizing uh, the video game uh, Mario uh, uh, Super Mario um, to kind of uh, have a sort of social commentary about that. Uh, and then, of course, in the Obama era, uh, there was a lot of different memes that uh, that incorporated popular culture, and and I think this is important because I think it's it's very important for us to to uh, acknowledge the role the popular culture has in in informing and shaping the kind of uh, frames of reference that we have uh, in understanding folk culture. This particular image is, was taken during the Osama bin Laden raid in 2010. It became one of the most, uh, most downloaded images in internet history, according to Flickr, when it came out. Um, but what people ended up doing is uh, also creating their own Photoshopped uh, traditions um, and use different examples. And some those of you who are familiar with American television will understand the first one. Uh, because this is a situation room, there's a, a television show called The Jersey Shore, and there's a character, well, it's not a character, it's a real person who calls himself the situation. So naturally, in the situation room, you have to have the situation. Uh, also around the time of the Osama bin Laden raid was the royal wedding uh, between William and Kate. And one of the things American media really loved to talk about was the funny hats everyone was wearing. So somebody came up with a brilliant idea of, of what if everybody in the room was wearing one of those funny hats. Um, other people uh, noticed that Obama had a particularly stern look on his face and thought, well, I wonder what it would look like if everybody in the room had Obama's head uh, on them while others just incorporated uh, various aspects of popular culture, um, just a, a huge smorgasbord of different sorts of things. So lots of different examples of this existed. Uh, and then, of course, there were some popularly circulating uh, image macros uh, that played off of uh, different things. Uh, one was there was controversy in the United States about whether or not Barack Obama was actually an American citizen. Funny enough, which was uh, popularized in part by our current president, Donald Trump, um, but I, I love this, this particular picture because it plays off of um, the, the motif of Obama having swagger and, and kind of uh, being uh, extra cool with the sunglasses, walking up to his plane, um, kind of lambasting um, that. Uh, but I want to turn back to celebrities and talk about how memes have utilized celebrities in times of scandal and things of that nature. Uh, and I'll use the example of the Tiger Woods scandal that took place in November of 2011. Now, this was an image that started circulating online uh, in uh, late November, early December, and the, uh, the email that I received that included this that uh, it was uh, titled, Happy Holidays from the Woods Family. 
Uh, and so basically what this was supposed to be was um, an example of a holiday tradition that some people in America follow where you uh, send a family picture and then have a report that kind of tells about the year that had gone by uh, and you share that with friends and family. Uh, but I thought this was particularly interesting because shortly after this had started, uh, shortly before this had started circulating, uh, it, it was discovered that pro golfer Tiger Woods um, had crashed his car at the end of his driveway and that apparently his wife had come with a golf club to rescue him heroically. Uh, but we later found out that she wasn't so much rescuing him as she was trying to beat the hell out of him with a golf club uh, for his numerous accounts uh, of, uh, of infidelity. Uh, and so this, again, is another example where information and knowledge about popular culture informed folk humor. Um, and uh, this popularly circulated online uh, to kind of demonstrate that. And I realize I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting, uh, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to uh, push through to the next next segment that I want to get into, but I'll stop uh, for a moment to say that photoshopping both here and in general tend to share very similar characteristics to materials and patterns observed in photocopulor, which again uh, suggests the presence of traditionality. Uh, in these newer folkloric forms that even, ha even have an, a greater capacity for instantaneous anonymous dissemination. The juxtaposition of the visual expressive modes with the familiar textual forms of expression have allowed the internet venue to become quite dynamic in its ability to register and convey a wide emotional and expressive range. Even so, the internet stands as both a conduit and also a skeptical source of validity in that domain that affords a kind of remoteness or detachment between the inform uh, information and the individual. Uh, now, the next uh, example that I wanted to talk about is the uh, sexual abuse scandal that took place at Penn State University. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, actually, I, I got my PhD at Penn State, and I was there when this scandal happened. Um, and this is a, a story that really involves sports celebrity. Um, the assistant football coach of the, uh, of the Penn State football, American football team, uh, Jerry Sandusky, whom you see creeping up in the bottom left here, um, was... Uh, arraigned on several counts of molesting and raping children uh, over a 30-year period. He owned a charity that he used to kind of groom um, different people that he later abused. Uh, and it was just a horrific, horrific story made worse by the fact that uh, it, he was caught a few different times and the university didn't appropriately act to protect the children or to turn Jerry Sandusky in, so he was allowed to continue acting out uh, for quite some time. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I naturally uh, thought this, there would be a lot of different jokes uh, about the Sandusky scandal or about Penn State's response to it. Uh, and in the bottom right here is uh, Joe Paterno, who is the head football coach. Uh, and I can't understate enough how much of Penn State football is kind of like a religion to the people who, who live in that area. It's kind of geographically isolated. There's not a whole lot of stuff going on for uh, almost 45 minutes to an hour in any direction. Uh, there's small towns and everything, but football is, is really kind of a way of life for a lot of people. It's a big part of the identity of Penn State. Uh, and so when this scandal broke, um, it really uh, had a, a very detrimental impact on people's morale, morale uh, and led to a lot of defensiveness, certainly, uh, in trying to rationalize that Joe Paterno did enough or whatnot. Um, but in addition to text and narrative-based humor, there was also a considerable amount of visual humor in circulation online in the months following Jerry Sandusky's arrest, including animated GIFs showing a simulation of Sandusky seemingly sexually assaulting ESPN sports commentator Kirk Herbstreet in the bottom left here. Uh, and numerous memes in the form of image macros of Sandusky pictured with children or in a shower setting juxtaposed with humorous text abounded. Photoshopped images of Joe Paterno, the, the football coach, as a Walmart greeter or as the Pope, uh, with all the role's symbolic baggage in tow, also popularly circulated. Additionally, several, diff several different photoshopped images of the Paterno statue being dismantled, surfaced, and reutilized the backdrop of the April 2003 fall of Saddam Hussein's statue in Ferdo Square in Baghdad, Iraq, for effectiveness. Here again, individuals relied upon existing knowledge from historical context, popular culture, and the actual news event while borrowing from existing humor traditions to produce new folkloric creations. Indeed, the premise of memes is their conceptualized and vernacular discourse are very tied, tied very closely to cultural inventory, for referential humor loses its punch without proper contextualization, self-aware or self-referential self content, and audiences' prior knowledge of ex existing folkloric forms. Uh, and I'll move on uh, to example of uh, Bill Cosby memes. Now, Bill Cosby is a revered, or was a revered 
um, comedian in the United States known uh, for his kind of fatherly-like um, kind of characteristic in, in, in popular culture. Uh, in addition to being a, a very famous stand-up comedian, um, he is, uh, all, was also known for a show called The Cosby Show where he played this affable Dr. Huxtable. So he was kind of like a father figure in American popular culture in a lot of ways. Uh, and then all these stories came out <clears throat> in recent years um, that he apparently had a decades-long habit of, uh, of, um, of drugging women with quaaludes and then having uh, uh, non-consensual sex uh, with them. Um, so these jokes that started to uh, show up online in the form of memes um, are playing off of, again, that folk knowledge about different mass-mediated forms. Uh, so, oh, you want me to take the first sip and looking like he's sipping on a mug of coffee is supposed to, again, be playing off of the, uh, the quaaludes um, motif. That's why when the pudding kicks in. And if you're, not under, if you're not sure or understanding why pudding is involved here, this is, again speaks to the importance of mass-mediated culture and uh, mass media and popular culture. Um, Cosby was a spokesman for Jell-O in the 1980s uh, and did many, many, many different uh, presentations and commercials um, that uh, talked about eating Jell-O or eating uh, eating pudding, uh, and so I mean it's often you know when someone tries to do a terrible Bill Cosby impersonation, it's always just something like this with the pudding. You know they always throw in pudding or uh, some kind of so it's, so pudding is is kind of a a, a, ver a verbal cue that that ties us back to uh, to Bill Cosby. Uh, but I've also recently been collecting jokes uh, from the Harvey Weinstein scandal, uh, who is a uh, media mogul or was a media mogul who was uh, very famous. Uh, as a producer of many Hollywood films. Uh, and also recently, actor Kevin Spacey was also uh, uh, revealed to have um, had tendencies that would be best described as being a sexual predator. Um, so, uh, You Had Me at No uh, is in reference uh, to uh, um, his uh, proclivity for uh, forcing himself on different actors and actresses. So I've collected some jokes uh, online <clears throat> that I'll share with you. Uh, I'll, I, I've written some of them down that I'll share momentarily. Um, so uh, one of the stories, and again, the interesting part of these jokes uh, is that um, the humor, again, relies on your familiarity with all the details of the story in order for you to fully be aware of it. Now, to kind of contextualize this next joke, I have to tell you that there was one of the reports uh, was that uh, about Harvey Weinstein was that uh, he lured an actress into his office uh, while he was masturbating and then ejaculated into a potted plant. Um, so this joke, uh, did you hear about Harvey Weinstein's new job? Uh, the uh, punchline is, uh, he'll water your plants for direct eye contact. So again, you have to be familiar with the, the backstory in order for you to fully understand what that is going on. Um, now that Harvey Weinstein's career in Hollywood is over, he should move to, move to Houston. Houston is used to getting fucked by Harvey. And this is a joke that's in reference to uh, Hurricane Harvey, which had devastated parts of Texas. Uh, in, in uh, predominantly Houston. Um, so that was uh, an example of that. Now, as I show you these examples, the good thing is where I'm in a room full of humor scholars, so you're going to recognize the traditionality of the next several jokes that are in riddle format uh, that, uh, that took place. Uh, how many Harvey Weinstein does it take to, take to change a light bulb? The light bulb will change itself right in front of him if he knows what's good for her. So again, this is playing off of uh, uh, off of uh, the story once again and the media's reportage of that story in order to elicit a humorous con connection. Uh, there's a, a television show uh, that was broadcast in the United States called To Catch a Predator and basically what it was was a sting operation where uh, a journalist would hang out at a house and working with a team of investigators would pose as young men or women online, uh, or boys and girls online, and would lure sexual predators to the house where they would then confront them on camera. Um, so uh, again, this is, again, you, you have to be familiar with the context in order to um, be able to uh, understand uh, the humor therein. Uh, and then of course, there was more than just riddle humor that I collected. Um, there was one joke uh, that invoked Hitler uh, that goes, uh, everybody is saying Harvey Weinstein is the worst person in history, but I think they're forgetting that Hitler is the worst person in history. I mean, if he hadn't finished what he had started, we wouldn't have to deal with Weinstein, who is Jewish. So uh, again, it's uh, it, trying to mess with decorum is, is certainly a big, uh, big part of that. 
Um, but again, this ties back to the different references uh, within American mass media. So in closing, I'd like to, to mention that historian Fred Inglis rightly observes that celebrity is one of the adhesives which at, the time, uh, which at a time when the realms of public politics, civil society, and private domestic life are increasingly fractured and enclosed in separate enclaves, serves to pull those separate entities together and to do its bit towards maintaining social cohesion and common values. In a significant way, jokes about celebrity scandals underscore this power. Their actions made them celebrities through nonstop coverage in the mass media, while their evisceration in folk culture boldly uh, unveiled, uh, uh, their, um, boldly unveiled the symbolic clout and dexterity of everyday people in times of discontent. As a community, humor, distinguishably drawn from folklore and popular culture, served as an agent for reclaiming power from the scandal while acknowledging the emotional toll it has left in its wake. Folklore, to quote the late Alan Dundies, is always a reflection of the age in which it flourishes. Cultural inventories vividly convey the patterns of media consumption and dissemination of traditional knowledge and contemporary vernacular discourse, often serving as a springboard for symbolic interaction by invoking analogs from folk and popular culture, especially in the form of humor. As an, interesting, uh, inter as an intersecting locus of folklore and popular culture, Cultural inventory blurs disciplinary boundaries. This frequently results in the amalgamations of motifs and structures, which impacts how folkloric materials are subsequently conceptualized and reappropriated in vernacular expression. Altogether, this represents a bold constellation of shared metafolkloric knowledge pertaining to folk and popular culture that, when activated by interacting individuals and groups, provides an impetus and source material for meta-commentary. Of course, there's some calculated risk and constraints. By tapping into popular culture, as I've explained, um, to explain something or to tell a joke, the individual teller wagers that their audience will hold some knowledge of the tangential cultural references that they call upon in the course of their interaction. If the audience does not understand the reference from the teller's uh, cultural inventory, the joke will be ineffective. The comic value of a joke often hinges on an audience's awareness of the joke's prototype. In a world where the rapid dissemination of information can be achieved with the click of a button, popular culture has become an increasingly dynamic component of vernacular expression in the wake of death, disaster, and scandal. This is represented in a shared body of knowledge that encompasses folk and popular culture. Individuals reference the information therein to analogize and contextualize the present through expression and discourse. Parodic memes reflect popular knowledge about the individuals and context that inform the creation and function as meta-commentary, how a news story has been reported, and the corpus of humor that has framed the story. More importantly, these parodic jokes also reveal individuals' awareness and mastery of joke-telling forms and their narrative expectations, which also entails making conscious judgments of what does and does not work as critical humor in the course of fitting new information into existing joke formulae. Again, celebrities serve as a vibrant canvas for folkloric expression because of their encroachment into our, cultural, uh, into our imaginary social worlds, a space now hybridized by the advancement of technologically, medi communicate, technologically mediated communications. Thank you. We're doing the questions after? Yes. Okay. Now let's, let's do a few questions now as well. So if there are any questions now, uh, we could also have two questions. And then in the end, uh, after Limer is finished, we could have a little discussion. Hang on. So any questions at this point? Okay. Thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. Um, you said that, um, and I totally agree, people need to have uh, a shared uh, awareness and shared knowledge of all kinds of, uh, of, of contextual information about, uh, in, in order to understand these, these, these jokes. To what extent do you think it also highlights the fact that people share this information in a kind of bonding way? I think that's uh, certainly a huge part of it. Uh, the, the act of sharing in and of itself is something that I'm interested in as a folklorist because uh, it's not just the jokes that I'm interested in, I'm interested in, in how they're transmitted and how they're shared. Uh, so I think certainly that's, uh, that's definitely a component of it that, that really helps to, to, uh, to make it more important to the individual tellers and members of the joking community. Um, by sharing it, you are 
you are essentially symbolically breaking bread with other people. It also gives you an opportunity to kind of test out whether or not um, how much you can get away with. I'll give you the example from my uh, collection of jokes at, at Penn State. Um, I was collecting jokes on campus and uh, someone overheard me and asked if I wanted to go to a fraternity party to hear more jokes because they promised that they had much raunchier examples of that uh, if I went with them. Uh, and, uh, and so I did and ended up in a, in a setting where I, had, I was surrounded by four males and their girlfriends, uh, each trying to outdo one another um, as they, trying to tell something progressively more gross and more disgusting and they were getting hit by their, by their partners. Um, but this was a great example of, uh, they were using it as not only a bonding experience, but also, I think, catharsis for feeling genuinely, wound, genuinely wounded uh, by the revelations in a lot of ways. Yeah, and that manner possibly also highlighting the fact that we share specific social norms together as well in, in, in an informal way. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you, Trevor. I thought that was extremely interesting. Oh, um, and as someone who um, also is concerned about face-to-face -face contact, I liked the way you <clears throat> talked about how emoticons uh, can be a way of um, accomplishing similar kinds of things online. Um, and this is probably a bigger question and something you address elsewhere. But uh, in terms of your uh, methodology, how do you know who is sharing with whom? It's a great question. Um, I don't always know the answer to that. Uh, I, I, I try to uh, go where I'm pulled when I'm doing uh, internet research. Um, oftentimes, uh, somebody will, someone will alert me to something going on, uh, and I follow forums or Reddit or 4chan um, and kind of see how people respond to one another. Uh, and when you can see it in, in threaded format, it's, it's easier to kind of see a longer conversation taking place. Uh, but it's not always in these very common areas that we find this, uh, this information. For example, when I, um, when I did research on Michael Jackson death jokes, um, some of the richest stuff that I found was on a blog about the New York Yankees. Um, and, and people were talking uh, about baseball and then transitioned into these, this de-evolution de of just ridiculously crass jokes. Um, so uh, so I, think, uh, I think that's also part of the equation. Thank you, that was very interesting. I I really enjoyed seeing how these things evolve. So, but uh, I was intrigued by something you said at the beginning about the very specific, special relation that people have with celebrities. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the variations in that. Because obviously, I mean, Michael Jackson is a very specific case, and Bill Cosby probably along with sort of more effective relationship or affiliative. But then Weinstein, of course, would be a different sort of... So would there be some sort of variation in the types of emotions involved, and how would that work with the types of humor that come from it? Yes, yes, yeah. I think so. Um, one of the things that I've noticed uh, in, in my research and, and, and in studying this um, is that the visceral kind of reaction that you get um, with certain celebrity deaths or scandals is often in relation to existing public perceptions about that celebrity. So with the example of Michael Jackson, um, he had a contentious history in mass media, especially after he was accused of molesting children, that kind of already established a foreground for a lot of the jokes that were made at his expense. Um, but with other celebrities that aren't quite as famous, um, it, it's, it's, it, it takes a violation of, of values, I think, to, to uh, in, to spark a lot of this different kind of commentary. Um, certainly, um, also celebrities that, um, that aren't particularly well liked or who have been, who have been involved with uh, scandals or drug abuse or things like that, things that, that have diminished their standing, um, have also been more of a target of humor. So one example I can think of is uh, the singer Amy Winehouse, who had a very public uh, battle with sobriety. Uh, when she died, uh, I uh, immediately went online and started uh, browsing forums, trying to check for humor, 
And it was there almost immediately. And I think part of that is because we already had this kind of contentious backstory involving her that influenced people to want to talk about it more. In the same way that when a celebrity like David Bowie or Tom Petty dies, um, who don't have that same kind of baggage associated with them, there's less of an impulse for humor at their expense. Um, whereas with these other celebrities, uh, or a super celebrity, as I would call Michael Jackson, um, that's not the case. such a history of all, for, all sorts of behavior that would have been unacceptable. So there is something in the construction of scandal that precedes it. I mean, David Bowie had a long history of drug abuse. He yeah. had sex with lots of very young girls, I think. But this is somehow, so it's interesting. So it's not the, the, the person, it's sort of the, the, the backstory and how it has been constructed. Because I could see you know, David Bowie easily have gotten into the same, but nobody bothered to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, and also right in the in the months immediately preceding his death, uh, he had, he had achieved a level of of fame and notoriety that was stable and generally positive. And I think because it was generally positive, it didn't inspire a lot of people to go after him in the same way that Michael Jackson had a lot of supporters, but also a lot of dissenters um, who were rightfully angered and and didn't want to celebrate it. Especially because um, you know commentaries that were taking place in television were predominantly positive. Let's celebrate his music. Let's celebrate his life. Let's not talk so much about that scandal. Uh, and I think that really annoyed a lot of people and made it much more um, uh, important for them to, to speak about it in, in a negative way, to kind of counter that narrative. Okay. Well, thank you. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, could you say that again? I said, how much do you think that the fact that David Bowie was a white male and Michael Jackson at least started out not as a white male? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting case. Um, I, uh, I, I don't really have an answer for that entirely um, because um, I have, I've mostly uh, focused on uh, the humorous text themselves and not so much about the racial component, especially because, as you mentioned, uh, Culturally, I mean, Michael Jackson um, was kind of kind of uh, a hybrid, a, a hybrid, hybrid, hybrid racially in his identity, um, because we have two stages of his career: his younger career, where he was identified as African American, and then later in his career, where he was um, where he was considered white by a lot of people. Uh, that reminds me of a joke um, that uh, that I heard about Michael Jackson that would make fun of his skin color, would make fun of his uh, feminine appearance and things like that. Um, I don't know that race played as much of a role in Michael Jackson's death, uh, uh, death jokes because more people seem to be interested in the child molestation accusations rather than his, his uh, status as a black man. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Gary Coleman, who is a, a black actor who was, uh, who was famous in, in the United States for his, uh, being on a sitcom in the 1980s. Um, but he was a black actor, and the jokes that I collected about him when he died didn't really have anything to do with his race. It was more about his height. Um, so he was very, very short. And so, for example, one joke that I collected about Gary Coleman was, um, you know, in honor of Gary Coleman's life, uh, flags will be held at four and a half feet. Um, <laughs> today. Um, so it, it, it was bypassed uh, racially in a lot of the jokes that I collected, but it was instead more of a commentary on what people knew about him in popular culture. Uh, very well, very well could be. Thank you. Um, well, and I'm equally happy to to invite the second keynote in this session, Limor Schiffman, who is uh, the associate professor in the Department of Communication and Journalism at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, her research also focuses on the digital media and internet memes and the social construction of humor. Um, and uh, her research on memes is widely known and cited, and her uh, book, uh, Memes in Digital Culture, I think is the first stop point for anyone who would like to um, <clears throat> study memes. And we are waiting for a sequel because things are changing pretty fast in this area. So we are happy to welcome you at this conference and in this plenary. <laughs> Hello, 
everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Lizzie. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, this conference has been my first international conference, uh, the first one I've ever visited, so I'm really happy to be here today. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the promises and perils of internet memes, and I'm going to go one step back, I think. Um, and I want to start with two examples. Do you remember this? 2014, uh, the summer, the internet was flooded. Huh moving on my computer, but not here. Just a second. Could we? This is weird. Look. Yeah, it's working. OK, great. It is working now. Let's see. Yeah, it is working now. The internet was flooded uh, with videos of people uh, pouring ice bucket water on themselves or on their friends as part of the ice bucket challenge. Now. You could just dismiss these as you know, silly things that people do on the internet, internet nonsense, but let's take a look at the numbers before we do that. Over one summer, 200 million people uploaded videos to social media. Three million people donated money towards the research of ALS, and $100 million were donated throughout one summer. Example number one. My second example is a more recent one. Me Too, Alicia Milano, the actress, uh, posted the following words. If you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write Me Too as a reply to this tweet. And very shortly after, millions of millions of women across the globe shared their stories, um, adding this hashtag, Me Too. Now, these two phenomena are really different from each other's, but I think that we could actually conceptualize the two of them as internet memes. So my talk would be on internet memes taking a very broad approach to the concept, and this is what I'm planning to do today. So first I'm going to give a telegraphic history of what are memes, how did this concept evolve. <coughs> then I will speak about why this concept should be redefined in the digital era, why we can't use Dawkins' definition anymore. Then I will talk about why this new definition actually helps us in understanding memes, economic, social, and political power. Then I will start talking about an understanding of mimetic humor, because memes and humor are not the same thing. And finally, I will discuss some of the perils of internet memes, uh, if we still have time. OK, so in the beginning, there was Richard Dawkins, um, who in his book, The Selfish Gene, um, kind of uh, introduced one chapter that did not deal with biology, but dealt with culture. And in this chapter, he introduced this small cultural unit that is analogous of, gene, for, of genes, and it calls meme, it's called memes. So memes are small cultural units of transmission, analysis of genes with flow uh, from person to person by means of copying or imitations. So this was uh, Dawkins' initial definition of the term meme. And um, he gave some examples of what are memes exactly in this chapter. So memes are texts. So for instance, nursery rhymes or jokes, something that you hear, you repeat, and at some point becomes a social phenomenon. But memes are also practices. So for instance, if I would ask you, what is, is it that we must have in a birthday party, what would you say? It's a question, not a tricky one. What would you say? Cake. Candle. Candle. Presents. Presents. Thank you. How do you know that? Songs, yeah. How do you know that? How do you know that this is what you have to have on a birthday party? Folklore. So this is something we've seen time and again, time and again, until we understand that, you know, this is what we have to do on a birthday. By the age of, of three, your son will come home and say, I want a chocolate cake for my birthday, because he saw it enough. So memes are practices, and for Dawkins, memes are also ideas. So the idea of heaven, the idea of hell, the idea of God, things that spread from person to person until they become something that is socially shared. Now, as you can see, this is a very multifaceted definition of memes. So memes are many things here. And in fact, this caused a fierce debate in the academic world. So the meme concept was a conceptual troublemaker for many years, and I guess it still is. So some uh, social scientists and people in the humanities said that the meme concept is just 
why should we use it? It's just another word for folklore or for sign or what's, what's the utility of memes? Others said meme is a really good concept for understanding social spread and diffusion. And the, the concept was somehow in the margins of humanities and social sciences. It was never central until something happened. And this something in the, is the internet. And suddenly, at some point, internet users started to use the term meme to describe what they do online, which is to you know, spread content, spread videos, jokes, photos. So my first question would be, why did the meme become such a successful meme in contemporary digital culture? How come people started to use this term to describe what they're doing? And I have two answers for that. The superficial explanation is that the internet is just a meme heaven. So memes can spread very easily, very accurately uh, to, you know, to, to all po corners of the globe, uh, points in the globe. It's really, really easy to spread memes online. But this would be just uh, the tip of the iceberg when we're thinking about the congruency between Dawkins's concept, which was way before uh, commercial internet and uh, the internet. And what I think is that the meme concept actually encapsulates the working of digital culture and the working of contemporary digital culture in two very fundamental and deep ways. First is diffusion from micro to macro. So when Dawkins spoke about memes, he spoke about those small units that spread from person to person until they become a social phenomena, until they, they become something that is known by everyone. Now, when we think about mass media, this is not how mass media works. Mass media, if you have a television show, you know, one moment, it transmits to millions of people. But if you think about how the internet works, and particularly how social media works, it's exactly spread from micro to macro. So content spreads from person to person until it becomes something big. Another very fundamental uh, facet of the term meme is the notion of reliance of mim on mimesis. So memes spread when we hear someone singing a nursery rhyme or telling a joke, and then we repeat it. Then uh, we imitate it. Now, on the internet, one might ex expect that people would start imitating, stop imitating because they could just you know, forward or share. But in fact, what we see online is that every video, every piece of content that passes some kind of threshold of popularity gets imitated in so many different ways. And I just defined two ways of repackaging. So people, this is the uh, seminal video, Charlie bit my finger. How many people, how many people have seen it? It's really funny. So this is Charlie bit my finger, I think more than billion views right now. But what I'm interested in is not the billion views. What I'm interested in is the hundreds of people who actually took time to imitate this video. So some of them mimicked it just you know, using their bodies. And others used remixes. So they used technology to remake this Charlie bit my finger video. And this, um, uh, uh, th this remaking, this redoing, this imitation happens not only with regards to uh, uh, cute babies or kittens. An example we've just seen, thank you, is the Situation Room. So the, the, the most, I guess, dramatic moments of the 21st century are now becoming memes, and we've seen some of those examples before. Another example that I would like to give, and I'll get back to it later, is how many of you have seen this one? Some of you. OK, so this is a meme called a pepper spraying cop. It was Occupy Wall Street 2011. Uh, this is a campus in uh, UC Davis, America. Um, uh, students were protesting. This cop was there. He wanted them to move. Um, they blocked the road. So he pepper sprayed them. Soon enough, it became a meme. So here is pepper spraying the, con the, the signing of the Constitution. Here is pepper spraying the Last Supper, and here is prepper spraying Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate, Kate Winslet. And so what we see basically in contemporary culture is this hypermimetic logic. Every major, tr every major event in the world now receives mimetic treatment, and memes penetrate many realms of life that are really unexpected. For instance, marriage proposal. So this guy from Taiwan is proposing marriage to his girlfriend through internet memes which became a meme itself. By the way, others have uh, then 
uh, imitated him. So uh, I hope I convinced you that internet memes really provide us with unprecedented opportunities for tracking and analyzing memes and by that understanding social, uh, cultural and political processes. They, these are really powerful, ubiquitous tools uh, and this is exciting. But in order to use the concept in a meaningful way to actually analyze digital culture, we actually need to do uh, two things. First, uh, we need to get rid of some access bag baggage associated uh, with the term. And second, we need to formulate a, a clear and, oh, I hate this word, operationalizable, yes? Uh, workable uh, definition of meme. So I'll start with the access baggage. What's the problem with, um, what, what's the problem with this term? Um, and Elliot Oren kindly also um, gave me yesterday uh, something that he's written, and I think it's along uh, uh, those lines, um, at least in part. Um, so first, uh, there are some really strong biological analogies underpinning the term meme. So many scholars have tried to make those analogies very, very detailed. So memes are compared with genes and are compared with viruses. And then what scholars try to do is actually find an analogy for anything that is you know, genotype, phenotype, anything that is in biology, try to find cultural analogies. And come on, this just doesn't work. It's really reductionist, and it doesn't lead, lead us anywhere. The second problem is the who's the boss problem. So in some of the works on memes, for instance, Susan Blackmore's book, memes are described as those bosses that control us, and we're like helpless, and we just must spread, must spread some kinds of content uh, because the meme is the boss rather than we are. But in fact, I think that those two are really kind of easy to get rid of because we could think of memes uh, and biology as a broad metaphor, not as something that we should cling to and find analogies to every aspect of. And uh, we could think of human agency as central to meme diffusion. So we could think of people as choosing what they want to spread, what they do not want to spread. Of course, of course it has to do with ideologies, with values, with power structures, but people still have some choice. So, we got rid of the access baggage, uh, but now we have this uh, mission of formulating a clear and workable definition of memes. And I would like to uh, suggest first, uh, I'm not trying to define, redefine memes. What I want to do is define internet memes. This is what I'm interested in. And to define internet memes, I suggest doing two things or uh, kind of two shifts maybe. The first shift, is from singular to plural, thinking of memes not as singular items that spread well, but as groups of texts. And I will try to convince you why. So in the pre-digital era, we did have memes, and we heard some of the, about some of those earlier. For instance, this is uh, Kilwer was here. I guess some of you know this one. It's a pre, uh, it's a pre-digital meme, uh, Second World War. Um, uh, so this um, drawing was all over the uh, um, field in, um, in Europe and then in America. And so this was a pre-digital meme. It, um, it evolved. It had many versions. But usually when someone saw this meme, they saw one version at a time. Okay? So if you were really successful, you would encounter five, six versions of it. But let's look at the other... Um, internet meme, which is the meme, put your head in a freezer. And this meme is basically um, instructions of put to, for people to put their head in the freezers, take a photo, and then upload it with a caption, which is like a, a series of numbers that other people could then look for this meme and find it. So in the pre-digital area, mutation was the exception. You would spread memes, and sometimes they would mutate. In the digital era, Mutation is the rule. People who are digitally literate are expected to create their own versions. So when you encounter a meme, you don't encounter a single text. You encounter a group of interconnected texts. And the second shift, I suppose, is um, identifying mimetic dimensions. So instead of thinking of memes as either ideas or practices, we can think of memes as texts that encapsulate uh, different dimensions of content form of sense that we could actually analyze. 
So my definition uh, of an internet meme is an internet meme is a group of digital items sharing common characteristics of content, form, and or stance that were created with awareness of each other um, and were circulated, imitated, and or transformed via the internet um, uh, by many users. Um, and here are some examples of internet memes. So for me, the whole group of Charlie Bit My Finger and its imitations would be a meme. Gangnam Style and all its imitation would be one meme. And Success Kid, do you know this one? I think we've seen it already, also today. This would be one meme. All the instances would be one meme. And uh, what we see here is that they actually share content, form, and stance. Sometimes only content, sometimes only form. Uh, uh, rarely only stands. So, for instance, the success kid meme is always about a kid who is successful against trying conditions. So, this is like puts in USB the right way on the first try. This never happens, right? So, we have a trying condition, then he succeeds. So, you have certain content, a certain idea. You have a certain form, and you have a certain communicative stance, which is humorous. Um, but I would like to stress now, and I'll get back to this later, that memes are not always humorous. Um, and this definition allows us to look at other types of content and say these are memes, although they're not humorous. So for instance, here we have It Gets Better um, or uh, confession note cards of um, harassment survivors. These are really, really not funny, but they're still memes. They're groups of interconnected texts with shared um, characteristics of content, form, or stance. So let's go over those mimetic dimensions and what do they actually mean. What they mean for me is that once someone imitates a text online, they have choice. They have a choice, they can decide what they want to preserve and what they want to alter. And the choice goes along three different, really different axes. So there's content, there is the message, there is the ideology behind the text. So for instance, here it's the uh, you know, message on police brutality, maybe excessive force. Then you have a form, a certain layout, which is, can be verbal, which can be visual, but it's a certain external layout. And then the trickiest one is stance. You, messages do not only convey uh, form and content, they also convey a message about communication itself. For instance, about who is entitled to communicate, what is the tone or king of communication, is it humorous, is it cynical, is it, um, um, is it serious, and people could actually decide that they're imitating or altering each one of those. So for instance, if we're looking at the variability of the um, of, of the um, pepper spray cop meme, what we see is that we can look at two very different groups of memes, okay? You, we identify one group which deals with politics, okay? The content is political, the king is cynical, um, and the message is really clear. It's, it's quite clear that what those memes want to say is like, this is ex the use of excessive force. This is ruining democracy. This is against the grain of what it is to be American. But look at this group. This group, which relates to popular culture, is much more polysemic, is much more humorous. Sometimes Lieutenant Pike even becomes a hero here. For instance, when he's pepper spraying a keyboard cat, which is a figure that some people don't really like. So something really interesting is happening when we look at memes uh, variability. And just another uh, final definitional, definitional moment, I would like to differentiate between viral content and mimetic content. So viral content is one unit that spreads well, and mimetic content is this group of, of texts, interrelated texts. And we need to differentiate between the two because the motivations for sharing and for imitating or for engaging with content are not always the same. So, okay, so I have a definition. Okay, um, why is it useful? I would like to suggest that it's useful if we want to unpack the social, the economic, and the political power of internet memes in contemporary culture. And I would like to start with the economic power and tie it with the concept of attention economy that probably some of you have heard of. So put simply, attention economy means that the most scarce resource that we have in contemporary, at least Western societies, is 
What's the more scarce resource? Time, exactly. Okay, it's not food, it's not clothes, it's not information. We have too much of those. It's time. You know, no matter what we do, we only have 24 hours a day. We only have certain, you know, years to live, and, and that's it. So the more scarce resource is time, and our, the attention that we could pay for, to media content, YouTube videos, is really, you know, limited. We have just limited amount of time. And my main argument is that internet memes are very economic in the sense that when texts move together, they draw attention to themselves. So people are attracted to the ice bucket challenge as a phenomena, okay? It's the accumulation of memes that actually attracts attention to this phenomenon. And also, if you create a video such as Gangnam Style, which is mimetic, each imitation draws attention to the original video. And in fact, if you imitate a famous video, then you're more likely that people will find you because when they're looking for Gangnam Style, they will actually also see your video. So there's really an advantage for text to move in groups. But actually, when people are imitating or doing the ice bucket challenge, usually they do not do it uh, for economical reasons. They do it uh, for social reasons. And probably the main point of my presentation is summarized in this slide. And this slide speaks about the social power of internet memes and is related to the concept that Barry Wellman and then others developed of networked individualism. And this concept says that in contemporary societies, there are two forces that we're struggling with. On the one hand, we're expected to be individuals. We're expected to craft our own life narratives, to be unique, to be digitally literate. On the other hand, we crave to be part of a community. And what internet memes allow us to do is to be ourselves together. So it allows us to both create our own contents. For instance, when I'm uploading a video of Charlie bit my finger, an imitation, I'm, you know, I'm exposing my own body, my own sense of humor, my own talent in, I don't know, building in Lego. So I'm expressing my individuality, but at the very same time, I'm expressing a communal affiliation to a group of people who actually know what Charlie bit my finger is. So um, internet memes are modes of communication that allow us to be simultaneously parts of a group and individuals. And the economic power combined with social power actually leads to political power. And in order to unpack the political power of internet memes, I would like to discuss a very specific genre of memes, which I tag uh, testimonial rallies. So testimonial rallies are internet memes in which individuals post their own po photos or written accounts as part of a coordinated political protest, as part of a coordinated political effort. And I want to give you four examples of testimonial rallies. So the first one from Occupy Wall Street is called I am the 99%. People writing down their life narratives, usually really agonizing stories about not being able to afford health care or education, ending with a slogan, I am the 99%, um, which um, alludes to the um, unequal um, spread of wealth in American society. The second one, more recent, uh, was created in a response of something that Tim Hunt, a distinguished Nobel laureate, said in a conference in Korea about women, ironically. So he said that um, in the conference. He said, three things happen when women are in the lab. You fall in love with them, they fall in love with you, and when you criticize them, they cry. So we actually said that, and as you might imagine, women scientists across the world <clears throat> weren't really happy. But instead of just moaning, they created a meme. And this meme was hashtag distractingly sexy. So they, they photoed themselves in their labs, and then they said things like, a filter mask protects me from hazardous chemicals and muffles my woman's cries, or here I am, I fell in love with my micro centrifuge. I'll get back to that one later. A third example is dressed like a woman. Donald Trump allegedly told the women in his staff and his campaign to dress like women. 
And in response, women in America uh, showed him what dressing like a woman meant to them. So here, for instance, me and my son, he's dressed like a man, I'm dressed like a woman, in case you couldn't tell. And many, many women did that. And the fourth one, um, a, a very different um, tone, I guess, I never asked for it. It's an Indian organization, nonprofit, that asked women to either upload or physically send in the clothes that they wore um, when they were sexually assaulted, demonstrating uh, that, of course, it doesn't really matter what you wear, um, you'll still be sexually assaulted. So what all of these do is reconstruct sporadic individual experiences as systematic and parallelated. And in this sense, they demonstrate the power of memes to bridge the personal and the political. So because memes um, are based on individual versions with a shared core, they simultaneously tell us in stories of individuals, but also make a political point, a point that is not related to Limor Schiffman or to Rizalinda or to anyone else, but is related to uh, systematic uh, power structures. So I think I covered the first three. And now towards an understanding of mimetic humor. I'll try to do it in 10 minutes. Let's see. OK, so towards an understanding of mimetic humor, and the towards here is really, really important because I'm just starting to think about it. So um, this crew diagram shows you that, uh, according to how I conceptualize memes, Memes and humor are not really the same thing. So you have humor that is not mimetic. You have memes that are not humorous, such as me too. But you have this vast area in between, which are memes that are mimetic. So I'm going to ask, what characterizes the intersection between internet memes and humor? What characterizes humorous memes? I'm just really making my first steps here. Um, and as any infant who does that, I would need some grasping points. So my grasping points would be two genres of mimetic humor, uh, which are really different from each other. The first one is nonsensical internet uh, memes, and the second would be testimonial internet memes, li like the one that we've seen now, distractingly sexy. They're very different, but I'll try to see whether humor plays uh, similar roles in them. So I'll start with this one. This is a, a work that was led by my uh, former um, MA student, Yuval Katz. And in this work, we looked at nonsense, mimetic nonsense. So our point of departure is that the internet is just flooded with texts that really don't seem to make much sense. For, this, for instance, this is owling. People posing to be owls in you know, many places. People putting their heads in freezers. People, you know, there's another one that I'll show you, like putting Nicolas Cage's face on anyone else's body. So like the internet is, is full of nonsense. And nonsense, uh, where's Mora? Nonsense, of course, is not a new phenomenon. And we have seen many encounters of, of you know, many forms of nonsense in pre-digital worlds. And uh, this is uh, one example. Thank you. Um, so nonsense, of course, is not new. But what is new, I think, is that digital nonsense is mimetic. So digital nonsense is not just one-off um, uh, you know, joke that one person does. Digital nonsense is mimetic in the sense that multiple participants create interrelated nonsensical texts based on shared formulas. So you have formulas for creating nonsense. And um, Yuval um, and myself examined those examples of mimetic nonsense using two di very different prisms. The first prism is perceptions of pre-digital nonsense. And mainly, uh, the perceptions of nonsense is lack of meaning, deconstruction of meaning, and play with meaning. And when we speak about meaning here, we speak about referential meaning. So the meaning of referential meaning is um, the relationships between um, you know, signs, utterances, such as words or drawings, with the world. And the notion here is that um, Nonsense actually plays with referential meanings. You have a text, and you're not sure why did they replace the dinosaurs with cows. What does that mean? Okay. But then we also have a set of another uh, uh, things that we need to consider that are features 
that enhance nonsense in social media, so the visual dominance, remix culture, and fatty communities, which means communities that what they have in common is basically that they share certain texts. Um, and here, I think we're looking at a different kind of meaning, which I would later call effective meaning. So what we did was to look closely at 139 examples of uh, mimetic nonsense, and we came up with those five uh, types of mimetic nonsense, uh, linguistic silliness, pastiche, interruptions, embodied silliness, and dislocations. I don't have time to get into each one of those, but each one of those is a very distinctive subgenre of nonsense. So for instance, embodied silliness is people doing very silly things with their bodies. For instance, this is a cinnamon challenge, and the idea here, you have to just swallow a spoon of cinnamon, no one can do it, okay? It's physically impossible, but it's still a challenge, and you have loads of videos of people trying. So the punchline of this um, aggregate, aggregative analysis of the five was that while mimetic nonsense often lacks referential meaning, like you know, swallowing cinnamon doesn't really tell us anything about the world, it actually carries an effective meaning. And what do I mean by that? What is effective meaning? So affect is a precognitive and social sentiment. I'm not entirely sure that I understand what affect is, but I think that the best uh, definition I found is in uh, Zizi Papakaritsi's book. It's a phatic note reproduced to signal that we're listening to someone, that before we understand, if you do that now, I would know that you're having an effective um, moment. So um, you do this, you nod as if you understand, as if you sympathize with someone or something, even before you uh, really understand what they say. Now, what we would like to suggest is that mimetic uh, nonsense is actually a phatic node. So when people uh, upload a nonsensical meme, what they're conveying is not only uh, something about themselves, I'm light-hearted, I'm digitally literate, what they convey is affiliation with meme culture. They demonstrate that they're tuned to this culture. So rather than saying something about the world, they're saying something about their affiliation with others, with a group. And this happens with each one of the subgenres we found. In each one of those, we see that there's a mechanism that actually stabilizes this sense of sharedness. So for instance, with the cinnamon challenge and with a lot of embodied silliness, it's this shared failure. So people share this, uh, this sensitivity or the sense of failure, and this bonds them. So nonsensical memes um, embed uh, three unique features. First, uh, communality. So you tilt, uh, we tilt here from an emphasis on uh, personal deconstruction of referential meaning uh, to communal creation of effective meaning. We're not really interested in the pivot of sign versus world. We're interested in the pivot of what is it that connects us as a community. And this also entails, weirdly enough, systemization of nonsense. So whereas in the pre-digital era, nonsense was this exploratory moment in which we um, questioned the relationships between science and the world and the arbitrary, you know, systematic ways in which we use words in certain ways, paradoxically, in digital culture, what we do is we create systems for creating nonsense. So nonsense is systematized, which also means that um, it has uh, inclusive potential. So there is a very low threshold for participation here. Almost anyone could you know, pose as an owl, I think. So I think it was never easier to um, join a community with saying so little. But this is happening right now. The second um, uh, meme genre that I would like to discuss is very different. So if nonsense doesn't want to make a point about the world, testimonial rallies, as I said, actually do. And I would like to unpack some of the humor underpinning those uh, using the example of uh, distractingly sexy. So what we have here is a very sophisticated way of using humor. So on, the, on this hand, you have the refuted assertion, three things happen when women are in the lab. We heard that one. Here we have the photo. And using Helga Kutthoff's conceptualization, you can see that there are many ironic cues, both textual and contextual, that allow us to understand that, of course, this woman is not serious. So we have this contradiction between her, how she looks, you know, her photo, and the caption, distractingly sexy. 
No one would think she's just sexy, sexy, right? And then we also have this um, uh, contextual knowledge that we have to know that he spoke about women crying in the lab, and she, of course, says, okay, this muffles my uh, women cry, but of course we know she does not mean that. So if we encounter this with humor theories, we could speak about incongruities going on here, and particularly a contrast between the hashtag, which is false and echoes Hunt's saying that women, you know, distract men in labs, and then the photo, which actually shows the truth, and the photo is of the creator. So when we're thinking about scripts and when we're thinking about competition between scripts, it's quite clear, the hierarchy is quite clear. The woman who creates the meme is the winner here. So if we take superiority theories um, into account, um, we could also say, and here I build on the work of Noam Gal, who's my PhD student, and herself built on Davis and Kuipers, that what digital irony does, it serves as a weapon of the weak, particularly for groups that are marginalized in offline words. And online, those groups can create irony, which presents them as intellectually superior. Because on the, on the internet, they're witty. So geeks or left-wingers in Israel on the internet, uh, they could win. And we could say that this is the weapon, weapon of the week here. These are women in labs, usually much younger than Tin Hunt. They did not win the Nobel yet. They're powerless in many ways, but still they're powerful through irony. But interestingly, irony here is not a weapon of mass destruction. And irony is used very gently here. And it is used gently in the sense that it's crystal clear for anyone who looks at these photos that they're ironic. It's not a barrier in terms of, OK, this is an internal joke, and only we will understand it. In fact, anyone who looks at those photos can understand the joke and get it. So in that sense, humorous testimonial rallies uh, do two different things. First, they build affect-based solidarity based on superiority. So these women bond, they feel superior, they feel connected to each other. But at the very same time, they also allow for evidence-based deliberation because each one of those photos is actually a piece of evidence um, in a debate, showing the truth. And because the joke is so easy to understand, in fact, it might be seen as reaching out to the other side, saying, OK, this is our evidence. You can show us yours. But are these qualities applicable to other forms of mimetic humor? I have to say I'm not sure, and this is you two days ago, uh, speaking about alt-right wing uh, memes. So I think that mimetic, mimetic humor definitely is built on affect-based solidarity, and we saw that both in nonsensical memes and in testimonial rally memes. Um, but evidence-based deliberation facing outwards probably happens in some types of memes, but not in others. But as I said, I'm, I'll stop now before I fall, because I'm just having taking my first steps. So I would like to wrap up by speaking about the perils of internet memes. So. So far, you know, I've been discussing memes in this really optimistic way. Memes are great. Memes empower you. Memes empower you politically. Uh, but of course, memes have some dark sides. And two of those dark sides relate to shaming and to the content, the actual content of memes. So I spoke about when the personal becomes political. But many, many times, the political becomes personal. So someone wakes, makes a racist remark, and the internet is flooded with messages not about racism, but about that person. So the political becomes personal persecution. And of course, content. Bottom-up content is not necessarily moral or important. I gave you examples here that I felt you know, that I like. But of course, there's so much content on the internet that is racist, that is anti-Semitist, that is misogynist, really, really terrible things. But because they're terrible, does it mean that as researchers, we can or we should ignore them? Because memes are small units that scale into big movements, and while they look at first, uh, you know, they, they might seem at first really chaotic and unable to, you know, you cannot really make sense of them. In fact, if you look closely into internet memes, what you can do is that you can 
understand the formation of contemporary culture. You can understand what people care about. Um, and this, I believe, um, is very hard to achieve, uh, but it, uh, it is as challenging as the ice bucket challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Limer. So a few questions maybe to Limer, and then we could do a little discussion. Um, thank you for your absolutely wonderful presentation. Uh, but a question I would like to ask is rather not about humor, mm -hmm. but rather a bit theoretical. So um, when you are saying that uh, well, you're defining memes, mm -hmm. uh, digital memes, how do you conceptualize digital? What's the difference between digital and not digital in your theoretical approach? Okay, so I would say that digital for me would be anything that could move through uh, digital communication. So for instance, uh, anything can be digital, digitized now. So for instance, uh, seen from a TV, you know, TV commercial or TV show, once it's on the internet, for me, it would be digital. What would not be digital, I guess, would only be face-to-face -face, uh, interactions which are not mediated, but actually any type of mediated content that could be mediated through computers, through, sm through smartphones, through social networks, I would call digital. So in that sense, it encompasses really vast, you know, amounts of texts, but it did not. It does not encompass, for instance, the chairs here, which Dawkins would conceptualize as memes. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm taking a step back. I'm saying I'm only doing texts in digital spheres. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for a very provocative presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask you about your minimizing the analogy with genes, uh, because the term did emerge with Dawkins, who was writing exclusively about genetic evolution. And the analogies, it seems to me, are very striking insofar as you, had, you have vast variety of memes flooding the internet and some of them survive, and they exert genuine influence on society, on subgroups of people, et cetera. So I just wanted, wondered if you would respond a little further to that. Oh, oh, thank you so much. So, um, of course. So I do this part of Dawkinson's theory I really take seriously in terms of I do believe that there are many memes, and those who survive and those who are more successful tell us something about you know, society and culture. And the less successful ones also tell us something about society and culture. So I think that definitely this m notion of competition and survival is something that I definitely you know, take into account. But I would not take into account the exact mechanisms. So the exact components of genes. And these are things, when you do this, it becomes reductionist. But the broad framework, of course, it's, it's really important. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the issue about crossover of terminology between disciplines, so you, we just had the thing about Dawkins' biological approaches to memes and internet memes. Um, your definition of affect struck me as rather bizarre. Um, and, and I said I, I still don't understand what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it, there clearly is emotive context, content and context and, and, and uh, oper in operation. Um, I didn't know the author that you were quoting. Can you give some background, please, on how this author is approaching 
what seems to me to be potentially quite rich, but perhaps a difficult, uh, needing to be adjusted definition. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I, as, as I said, affect, I really like the term emotion. I think it's simple and, you know, I know what an emotion is. But I kind of liked, so Zizi Papakarisi's writing is on internet and affect and technology and affect. And what she actually tries to say is that um, affect is this kind of, at least in the digital environment, it's this kind of communicative form. So it's this kind of form that um, allows you to feel this sympathy towards others and to signal it through really small cues, such as a just repeating a certain hashtag or just um, posting, I don't know, ju just, just a reaction, but, you know, clicking a reaction button of like or, or smiley or anything else. So it's this kind of um, emotionality which is tangled with sociability that she's discussing. And this is what I found intriguing with medical nonsense because we're really trying to make sense of this you know, notion of people doing really, really silly things on the internet just for the sake of it. And when you look at it as affect, as people trying to connect with each other through those little markers, um, then it kind of makes sense. But I have to say, I'm still not, I'm still struggling with affect. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I believe it was Malinowski in the early 20th century who used the term phatic communion. Yes. Oh, to here. refer to what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, so it's yeah, here. Yeah. Right. And so it was, um, as I understand it, it was when he said, for example, when an, an English speaker says, how are you? We don't really want to know. We're simply signaling that we're in communication yes. with each other. Um, but what I wanted to ask about, and I, uh, it just strikes me that this is related to your final point about the perils. Um, it seems to me it's a peril to call anything nonsense because we're, we're, in, we're beings that interpret. So any level, like even that cat in the computer, you know, that's the lurking, the lurking state or the lurking whatever, right? I mean, the person eating cinnamon, um, that could be interpreted as, um, okay, well, we're wasting our time doing this when we could be engaging in important political action, for example, or it could be how stupid are these people mm -hmm. and putting your head in the freezer, I mean, for heaven's sakes, you know, putting your brain out of commission. So, you know, I mean, all I'm saying is that you, to call something nonsense is potentially perilous, I think. Interesting. Okay, so I would, uh, that's a really interesting, two really interesting points. So fatty communities, in that paper, we discuss it in length, because yes, it's the notion of fatty communication that is really strong in online communities, and nonsense seems to flesh it out, because the, the texts themselves do not seem to have meaning in terms of a preferred meaning. So I would say, yes, you can read into it a lot of different things, but it's not that you have a striking meaning that uh, you know is evident as the one that when you see I don't know the pepper spray cop pepper spraying the Constitution. So you have to work much harder, and it's much more polysemic. And sometimes you know it's impossible to have this one meaning that you can infer from the text. But definitely, those seemingly nonsensical texts have a lot of meaning. This is what I really want to say. Thank you, Will, and thank you for your presentation also. Um, the question is for both presenters, I guess. Um, do memes let us deal with sensitive topics, perhaps as a weapon that lets us be anonymous since we're online? And um, does this less does the <laughs> Dust in the wind. No. Does this let us laugh even when content poses ethical problems? Yeah. Okay, who wants to go? Uh, 
Yes. I actually didn't hear the first part of that question. <laughs> so I, was, I, was, I was too busy determining whether or not I should come up to the front, so I missed the first part. This is the question. Okay. Got it. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I think that's uh, that was certainly um, um, more of a common part of the early part of the internet where anonymity was um, I think more commonplace. Nowadays, we have more a lot more I think identifying features um, to determine who we are, where we come from. Uh, certainly through things like social media. Social media allow us to um, put forth an identity that I think uh, complicates things. So I think um, the anonymity has in the past allowed for people to get into nastier and dirtier topics without the same fear of reprisal that we could uh, normally see if we were in a regular face-to-face -face social situation. Yeah, I, I think um, certainly from a folkloristic standpoint, uh, I, I see it as uh, an outlet for, for expression. And, uh, and memes are, have the ability to uh, allow us to uh, engage with topics that we can't normally engage with in, in regular everyday conversation. It, it allows us to open a, a play frame to, to, to be able to talk about things that are difficult or uh, unsavory um, because uh, it, for a lot of different reasons. I think in my own research I've seen um, it's often in response to uh, how things are covered in mass media. Um, so people are responding somehow in some ways um, to um, how our story is presented and um, because of we're told to, to feel a certain way or are shown the same images over and over and over again um, a lot of the humor that surfaces is, is almost as much of a commentary on the way that we've received that information as it is the act of play itself. Thank you both for really interesting presentations, which I really greatly enjoyed. I have a, one question for both of you and one for I think mostly for Limor, but most, most maybe also. So one question I have is the use of sort of the, the rhetorical use of, of these sorts of images on the internet. So I think they tend to be described as something that people sort of present to the world and then that's it. But I think one of the really striking things that increasingly people are able to have lengthy conversations that consist just of memes and then other memes and then other memes. And can you say something about that? Because I think that's really interesting, what's going on there. And the second, I think, is mostly for Limor. And it's about this evidence-based thing. And I was, actually, this came up several times in presentations. So with Jonas at the Grad Student Award, and again with Evo Niwa House, I'm not sure if he is. So there is, in this sort of the, the new political meanings of, of humor and memes, uh, there is this increasing sort of dichotomy between populist forms of communication and sort of more so typically called elite-based forms of where where sort of uh, where evidence-based and rationality is somehow portrayed. And I think it's very interesting to think of memes as a specific intervention in this sort of politics where where memeing can be a way of showing yourself as really rational. So it's a very interesting way. And I think Ivo, I'm not sure if he's, he had the example of a Dutch comedian. I think we all, many of us might know the example of John Stewart, which is not memetic, but it does the same thing of restore or return to sanity. So being humorous by showing that you're very reasonable or the other way. So and I think it's interesting that memes also, can, even though they have been constructed as playful, they can be seen as a way of presenting yourself as completely rational and reasonable and different from all these insane people, which is a very unexpected way of using humor. I think very different from the way we understand it. So. Thank 
you so much for this question. And it actually taps into something I didn't have time to explore here, so, uh, which is uh, the, the paper is called uh, Testimonial Rally Rallies and Mimetic Authenticity. And in the paper, I explore the notion of memes as expressing two kinds of authenticity. So you have external authenticity, which is equivalent to truth, authenticity about the world. Um, so it's like gathering evidence. This is my own photo. And then you have internal authenticity, which is authenticity that relates to some kind of inner core. This is my opinion. And interestingly, what this type of internet memes does is it combines external and internal authenticity. So it presents the, you know, the, com the comedians, this, those women, as authentic. Uh, because they both have this evidence, this is you know, my real photo in the real world, this is evidence, and we gather it collectively, so it's a body of evidence, very scientific, very objective in a way, but also combining it with this is my own experience, this is me, this is my body, so, um, and I'm expressing my feelings, I'm expressing my emotions, I'm expressing my thoughts, so in a way I think that what you said is that Memes actually, this kind of mimetic expression actually combines those two forms of authenticity in a way that is very interesting and meaningful, but I do think it's very specific to this subgenre of memes. And as you said, others use it, uh, the, you know, truth, authenticity, very differently, like the one that you show of uh, uh, Osama bin Laden and his intercourse with um, um, a camel. Um, camels. So, you know, this is also evidence, of course, but they, these are fake evidence and are supposed to be fake evidence, and they also make a point, but in a very different way. So I think there's an interesting typology lurking here that we could further think about. Uh, to add to that, I would say it's also important that we realize that when it comes to digital communication, that we are essentially hybridized communicators now. We, we speak in three dimensions. Um, we, uh, our, our authentic self is no, no longer a binary between the virtual and the corporeal. Uh, there are extensions of the same thing. Um, I, the example I often think of is uh, sending a text message. You know, we tend to think, I sent a text message. We don't think about it as a mechanical process that goes through towers and things like that. Um, we we uh, are seeing much more blurring of that, that line. and. Uh, um, certainly now with the uh, prominence uh, of virtual reality technology becoming more available and more affordable, um, even that is developing into kind of an interesting space for, for folkloric expression. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's complicated, but I think uh, it's important that we, we recognize that we, we are not just a digital self or a physical self, we're, we're both simultaneously, uh, and utilize those, those venues advantageously for expressive purposes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and just to be a nerd, there's another microphone there. We can just start passing things around. So that'll be fun. Hey, thank you very much for both. Um, I had a question um, having to do with some of the categorization that you employed. Um, and it strikes me that there's a, a remarkable similarity between the, uh, the testimonials and the embodied silliness, because those are both digital things that are really just using the digital networks to uh, demonstrate action, demonstrate participation, demonstrate performance, and then that's mediated. And that's very different from the, the memes that are image macros. And for one of the things about an image macro is that the the, the creator is still largely anonymous. Yes, they're participating. Yes, they can take. Um, uh, pride in, in their pr particular manipulation of the received form, but it's a contribution as opposed to a statement. So what is the difference between a meme that is about the expression of performance and the meme that is about the participation in a uh, uh, aesthetic act of digital manipulation. Because the other thing about macros, that those truly, going back to Darius' question, those are digital because they couldn't exist without the digital technology, as opposed to a snapshot, which is being sent through digital channels, but has existed before. 
Hi, so I think that this is a really interesting, you know, theoretical differentiation between the performative memes and the image macros. I would conceptualize both as memes, but they're really different in what they do. And of course, you put yourself out there. Um, it's very different than anonymously putting, uh, you know, just sending an image macro. So, um, but what I would say is even putting yourself out there is different from what you would do in the pre-digital era in the sense of the magnitude of imitation, the sharednessness of this moment, and the publicness of this moment. So we all imitated our teachers, I guess. Um, but it was like those private little moments and not public statements that are meant to be um, imitated by others. So I guess there's something about the magnitude of that that scales, you know, that, that is quantitative, quantitative but then has a qualitative effect of the performativity and the bonds that could be created when people are doing the same thing but in different places. Um, and in that sense, these are, I think, are more maybe politically powerful, the ones in which you present yourself. Um, but I think that still image macros have an important role in disseminating um, forms of communication. And uh, to answer Hezelinda's question, yes, they're becoming image macros are now replacing uh, language. So Asaf was sitting here. Um, his PhD uh, work is about um, memes as lexicons. So the uses of memes as uh, ways of you know, expressing uh, emotions, such as sadness and happiness. So instead of saying, I'm happy, I just you know, send you this meme, and it's kind of clear that I'm happy. So I think these are really two different things, the, ex the using memes as modes of expressions, as a new visual language. Um, which are somehow detached from the body and using your body to, um, you know, to say something um, which kind of uh, continues offline spaces but also creates this new one. I think I just gave you a really complex um, answer to a really good question. Sorry. Uh, well, I think we could... Uh, thank you for opening so many interesting, like, new... Areas. Questions from the audience were great as well. I'd just like to maybe ask a concluding question. So you both describe the way that memes developed, you know, where they come from and so on. So the question in short is, can you speculate on when they, where they are going? Because there is this, like, understanding, I guess, that uh, uh, these image macros might be the, the optimal way at this moment to express oneself on the internet, but there might be other things coming up. So what do you think? What is the direction? That's a great question. Uh, I certainly think um, in Europe, it, it's uh, the issue of Article 13 is something that's probably been on a lot of people's minds. Uh, it's certainly been on my mind uh, about uh, issues of copyright. In, in the United States, we, we tend to classify memes as part of uh, the fair use doctrine, that we can use it because if we're using it for educational or for parody purposes, uh, it's, it's not harmful uh, in a legal sense. Um, I'm not 100% sure where it's going. I, 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 feel like, um, I feel like memes are a, a great shorthand now for uh, expressing emotion. Um, in a lot of cases when dealing with death and disaster, um, relying on visual humor to tell a story and in place of being emotionally vulnerable um, has been something that I've noticed. And I think that um, uh, we're, we, certainly in American culture, we're finding ways to replace uh, emotional intimacy and vulnerability with uh, deflections, often through humor. And uh, that takes place in the form of macros. But uh, uh, I'm not sure 100% where it's going. I, 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 I'm curious to find out and plan to keep looking. So in terms of forms, there's a GIF form that we have not mentioned, which is taking over. But I have no idea what's going to happen. You know, I, cannot, I can only say, you know, I can barely interpret the past. So forecast the future is really hard. We just have to pay attention, I guess. That's, that's it to do. <laughs> Uh, okay, yes, there is, uh, well, the Center of Excellence of Estonian Studies, where we also have a group that does study contemporary folklore, including the memes, 
uh, just wants to extend both of you an invitation to come for a week to Estonia <laughs> to do anything that you, you like to do to work with us. So here is one for you, <laughs> an official invitation from the head of the Center of Excellence of Estonia, in Estonian Studies. Um, yes. <laughs> and thank you. So, um, also, there is one announcement by uh, Aliona Ivanova and Sergei Troitsky, if we could keep your attention for just one moment. Yes, um, uh, together with uh, Sergei, we are uh, trying to gather Russian scholars and then to maintain uh, international exchange also um, with Russian scholars and to include them more. And I'm very glad that uh, at this conference we uh, managed to, to gather much more, uh, I would say, Russian-speaking people. Yeah. Uh, so we would like to invite um, all of you who are interested to our next uh, conference in Russia. Not ISHS conference, but just our Russian conference, which uh, takes place in St. Petersburg every two years. And the next one will take place uh, next May, on the uh, 29th of May, for three days. So um, we don't have, an, we won't have a website for the conference. So those of you who are, are interested in, in this information, uh, we printed this um, invitation letters, or you just can um, come and give your email address to me or Sergey. So we will include you in our data database and we'll. Um, keep you in course of uh, the future conference or future conferences. So we just invite all of you who are uh, interested in Russian scholars, Russian humor scholars, or just Russian culture, or just you would like to visit St. Petersburg uh, on this event. So thank you. Mm? Uh, about the language. well. Yeah, um, last time Sergei um, worked hard and managed a very good synch synchronized uh, translation. Yeah, I, I really hope we, yeah, we will organize it also this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you to ask. Yeah, and, and, and last time it was quite an international, so we could understand. It was the first try and we couldn't understand each other very well. Thank you. <laughs> Yep, we will put the letters of information on the registration desk, okay? Uh, one more announcement is that the panel on the man who spoke snakeish, uh, we have decided to move it to another room because there will be film screening next door and otherwise it will uh, disturb the, the discussion. So it will take place in A224 instead. <laughs>